I'm Rook Ringer, a member of the GP Solo Diversity Board, and I'll be moderating today's program. It's the Activate Diversity, Don't Say Gay, and the Stop Woke Act, Lasting Impact on Free Speech and Education. Uh, we would like to thank our ABA co-sponsors, the Commission on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, the Government, Government and Public Sector Lawyers Division, the Section of Civil Rights and so Social Justice, and the L Young Lawyers Division. We would also like to thank the Ohio State Bar Association for their support of the Activate Diversity Series. <clears throat> this program is being recorded. The recording will be available on ambar.org forward slash GP Solo. Feel free to submit questions via the Zoom Q&A. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will address as many as we can. There will be a link in the chat to the speaker's bios. And uh, I'll probably get to the questions from the chat at the end. Okay, uh, let's get started. I'll introduce everybody. Uh, first off, we have Michelle Rayner from the Florida House of Representatives. Michelle is an attorney and the state representative for House District 70. She was born and raised in Pinellas County with generational roots in the area. Her mother was one of the first black social workers in St. Petersburg, Florida, and Michelle's uncle served the city of St. St. Petersburg, District 55, now District 70, and the state of Florida as the first Black secretary for the Department of Corrections. Following in her family's footsteps of service, Michelle achieved her goals of being a public defender and came back to the community that raised her. She earned her BS in political science and international affairs from Florida State University, her MS in international affairs, and her JD from Florida Coastal School of Law. Michelle served as an assistant public defender for Hillsborough and Pinellas Pasco counties and legislative aide to former state Senator Arthenia Joyner. She ran her own law firm, Civil Liberty Law, before joining Denman Perlman Law. She made national headlines for st stellar work focusing on criminal defense and civil rights cases, including that of Marques McLaughlin, Yasmin James, and most recently, Barbara Pinckney. Her successes have led her to be named a rising star by Super Lawyers four years in a row and Fred G. Menace Bar Association Community Award. Prior to her election to the State House, Michelle served as local counsel for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Inc., the Fred G. Menace Bar Association, and on the board of I Support Youth. In 2020, she won a competitive she won a competitive primary in Florida's House District 70, beating three other House candidates to take the seat unopposed in the general election. She became the first openly queer Black woman to be elected to the Florida House. As a freshman legislature, she was appointed to the House Democratic Caucus 2021 legislative team as the deputy whip and championed equity in policy while advocating for vulnerable communities and Florida's working class families. Okay. Uh, if you want to say hi, uh, Representative Rayner, uh, after I've uh, said all that, feel free. Wow, Rock. Uh, hello. Hello. That was the thinking to myself. I, uh, this is quite a bio. I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, but thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I look forward to sharing with all of my colleagues and um, just kind of giving insight on what's going on with legislation and um, how it's, it's going to impact practitioners. Thank you again. I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Our next panelist is John Harris, John Harris Maurer. He's public policy director at Equality Florida. Strategically positioned in downtown Tallahassee, John Harris Maurer keeps an eye on the Florida Capitol at Equality Florida's public policy director, or as public Equality's Florida's public policy director. In that role, he serves as Equality Florida's frontline lobbyist in the Capitol and leads, leads local policy work around the state. He attended Rice University and received his law degree from Florida State University, where he served as editor-in-chief of the Law Review. His policy and political experience pr prior include stints in the Texas House of Representatives, Florida House of Representatives, and working on the Annie Parker for Mayor campaign in Houston, which successfully elected the first openly lesbian mayor of a major American city. 
Prior to joining Equality Florida's staff, John Harris spent five years in private legal practice for administrative and environmental law and continues to practice with Panza Nara PA. Hi, John Harris. Hi, Rick. Thanks for having me. Uh, for folks who don't know, Equality Florida is the state's largest civil rights organization dedicated to securing full equality for Florida's LGBTQ community. So excited for the discussion today. All right, our next panelist is Moranika Fajana. Is that correct or is it Fajana? I just realized that. Fajana. Fajana, okay. So Moranika, Moranika Bajana serves as assistant counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Prior to this role, Moranika was a special counsel at the New York State Office of the Attorney General, where she worked on civil rights legislation, policy, and advocacy matters. Moranika previously worked at a, as a tenant attorney representing individuals, tenant groups, and tenant associations across New York City at the Legal Aid Society and the New York Legal Assistance Group. Moranika began her legal career as a human rights researcher working in Berlin, Germany and Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Moranika's work at the New York State Office of the Attorney General included legal challenges to the New York City Police Department's policing practices, the United States Postal Service's transportation policies, and the United States Immigration and Custom Enforcement's policy of arresting non-citizens in and around New York State courthouses. As a tenant attorney, Moranika helped low-income families secure habitable housing, defend against eviction proceedings, and obtain relief for harassment and racial discrimination under the Fair Housing Act. While working as a human rights researcher, Moranika published scholarly articles and reports on international humanitarian law, extraordinary rendition, the right to water and election integrity in Haiti. She obtained her JD from Columbia Law School and BA from New York University. She is admitted to practice in New York in the District of Columbia. She is the proud daughter of Nigerian immigrants. Say hi, Marenika. Good afternoon, everyone. Excited to be here and continue the discussion. Okay, uh, Isabella Nascimento is an associate at the, in the firm's litigation department with a focus on media and entertainment law. She also works on commercial litigation matters. Prior to joining the firm, Isabella worked as a staff attorney at the American Civil Liberties Union of Minnesota, where she litigated cases on the First Amendment, government transparency and accountability, and public access to data. She has experience drafting and editing legal briefs, court orders, and published and unpublished judicial opinions. During law school, Isabella served as a student attorney in both the Federal Criminal Justice Clinic, representing indigent defendants in their federal criminal cases, and the Civil Rights and Police Accountability Project, focusing on Section 1983 lit litigation, including representing through the tri true trial the family of an unarmed Black teenager who was shot and killed by a white police officer in Zion, Illinois. Everybody, welcome, Isabella. Hi, folks. Great to be here with you all today. I'm excited for the conversation. Well, I'm not going to read the really long um, bio of me as I'm not really going to be doing a whole lot of talking. All you really need to know about me is I am a Florida civil rights attorney and a transgender woman myself. So this sort of thing is uh, you know, really important to me. Uh, other than that, we'll go ahead to get this uh, party started right away. And uh, the first thing I'm going to ask is Representative Rayner, what, since you are the, the uh, representative here from the, uh, the legislation or, you know, legislative body, sorry, uh, can you explain what are the Don't Say Gay and Stop Woke Acts? Yes, so uh, so I want to kind of just level set for you. This has uh, been foundational uh, 
since I came into the house. So the first year we had a tax on trans children. Um, and then the next year we had these two bills introduced this part of this, I would say this culture war package, right? So the don't say gay bill, or as um, it's known, uh, I think it's HB 1557, parental rights and education bill, basically seeks to eliminate the existence of LGBTQ people in the class and students and families in the classroom. And so there's a couple, there's a lot that's problematic with this bill, but I'll kind of highlight just real briefly, two of the most problematic things. It says that to uh, stop instruction of uh, uh, sexual orientation or, or gender and gender identity in K through three and and or age or age appropriate. So it's not an and or age appropriate. So we're all most, I think all of us are lawyers on here. So, or so words mean things and and or that in, you know, I spent a, quite a bit of time on the house floor questioning the bill sponsor who is not a lawyer about what is the and and or mean and how does that actually work? And it also, and I'll also defer to John Harris as well, who he and I worked very closely together with regard to both of these bills, um, if I'm missing something. Um, and I also believe there's another part of, of the bill. Um, John Harris, am I missing the other part? Please, please feel free, because I'm, 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 I'm kind of getting stuck on that. And I'll talk about the stop work real quick. No, that was great. Certainly that provision on uh, banning classroom instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity in K-3 through three, or uh, as otherwise deemed not to be age appropriate was really what attracted the most attention there. Yeah. And then, so we're looking at, then we hear, you know, the Stop Woke Act, which is HB7, which is basic, which is basically not allowing, you know, the, the correct accurate teaching of Black history in the classroom, but also if you are a business, if you are, you know, so if you are a small business or a corporation and you do diversity treat, uh, diversity, uh, 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 now what's the word y'all? I'm sorry. I'm blanking. Diversity trainings. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Diversity and inclusion trainings. Um, and someone feels uncomfortable then they can have, you know, means to bring a lawsuit against that company. That company can be fined and all of these consequences that can happen. And I will point out one of the bases is that the, that lead, Republican leadership in the governor's use, I know this by, is bipartisan, so, or nonpartisan, so I'll just say the governor's use is that there are supposedly issues of children who have been pointed out in classrooms saying white children saying being called the oppressor and this and he doesn't want to make sure that this happens in Florida and um so th that's kind of really the broad um overview of those two bills Rook. all righty and this question is for Representative Rayner, John Harris, and Mornika. Uh, what do such legislations claim to do versus what they really do? I'll jump in first if I can on that one. Um, I appreciate Rep. Rayner's summary of the bills. And I think she's right. These are really similar because they're tied together as part of this overarching censorship and surveillance agenda that we've seen in Florida that's now being. Uh, really extrapolated to other states. And on a provision like the Don't Say LGBTQ bill, you again had this clause that says, we're banning classroom instruction on sexual orientation and gender identity. Well, what we know is sexual orientation and gender identity is really about who we are and who we love. And that is always age appropriate. Um, as somebody who is very recently now a father myself, you know, I and all of us can recognize there are kids in these classes, including in K through three, who may have two dads or two moms. Um, and those families are always going to be appropriate to acknowledge. There's nothing, um, you know, illicit about those families. But representatives like Representative Rayner um, and senators offered 23 different amendments across the House and Senate trying to bring more clarity to this bill. And all of them were rejected by the majority. And 
So they were talking a lot about this bill and referencing things like sexual acts, but they rejected the amendments that would have narrowed the scope of the bill to make it specific that we're really prohibiting discussion of sexual acts. Uh, so really unfortunate there. We saw a lot of that pushback again on um, positive amendments on the Stop Woke Act as well. And it's really about chilling speech. Both of these have strong enforcement provisions uh, and are just unconstitutionally vague so that teachers, employers, diversity trainers, <clears throat> excuse me, don't know often exactly where the line is. So they just won't have these conversations at all. Um, and that's really problematic and everybody loses out, of course, in those scenarios. So, you know, we have on one hand the sort of black letter of the law. And on the other hand, you have the bill sponsor on the floor of the Senate when it comes to don't say LGBTQ saying, well, really, we're worried about all these kids coming out nowadays because they want to be celebrities on TikTok. So the intent behind this legislation is very clear. Um, and, you know, there is this silencing of having honest conversations. It can, they can and should be uncomfortable conversations sometimes about things like racism and sexism uh, that are sort of the true target for these bills to curtail that sort of speech and those representations in the classroom. Yeah, I just wanted to add a few thoughts about the Stop Woke Act, so that's HB7. Um, in terms of what the bill proponents and Governor DeSantis, who also was a proponent of this bill in that he um, introduced a policy proposal called the Stop Woke Act, where he kind of laid out his vision for what should happen. Essentially, he wanted to take a rule from the K through 12 context that prohibited the teaching of the 1619 project um, and other sort of works and, and critical race theory uh, among them and apply that to not only higher education, but also all um, workplaces as uh, Rep Rainer mentioned. So something that the bill proponents said that the Stop Woke is doing is trying to prevent indoctrination. There were these references to, you know, children being made to feel terrible because of their race and being told that they're responsible for, you know, slavery and other past atrocities. But um, Judge Mark Walker in the Northern District of Florida, who's the main judge who has actually reviewed the constitutionality of this, the Stop Woke Act actually said, this bill promotes indoctrination and it promotes indoctrination of viewpoints that the state legislature agrees with because the way the bill works is it says there are eight concepts that are dangerous and controversial and that shouldn't be promoted in schools. You can still talk about those concepts. You can criticize them all you want. You can say color blindness is uh, a great thing, and you can criticize critical race theory all you want. It's only, you're only running afoul of the law if you promote those ideas. And when the state does something like that, and when it does something like that in a way that it's imposing really harsh penalties, what it's actually doing is telling the state of Florida and everyone in the state of Florida, these are the viewpoints that are okay to share and express, and these are the viewpoints that are not. I, I, I'm, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to add. Um, so, Renika and I are working on um, some shared litigation about this. And I think what's interesting is um, the, the framework for the bill and what this le legislation claims to do is really in the name. <laughs> and in particular, right, in, in for example, HB7. They designed the acronym <laughs> to be the Stop Woke Act. Um, they didn't hide the ball here. It's it's fascinating to me that now in the course of this litigation, they've kind of pivoted and said, well, actually, it's not so much that, that we're trying to stamp out a particular viewpoint at all, but instead trying to reach the constitutional ideals of the Equal Protection uh, Amendment and uh, the Free Speech Doctrine. and and. Um, so it's almost 
as if they have now uh, realized that despite that there is a record of, of what they were going for and what the legislation was after, what it claimed to do and what it really does, um, they're now pivoting and it's telling a different story, right? And so trying to kind of walk some of that back. Um, and I think that's really notable. Um, so I just wanted to, to flag that quickly. Yeah, I, I would definitely would agree with all of the points that have been brought up. I, I also, you know, one of the things that I did along with um, partnering with uh, John Harris, but other lawyers who are in um, our particular caucus, we really worked hard to make a record for the lawyers who are going to litigate, who are going to litigate this uh, in court. And what we're finding is that the unintended or intended consequences, depending how you look at it, is that uh, litigation has begun on these on all both of these bills day one um, that you know taxpayers are paying for. Uh, we all flagged the lawyers who. Uh, we're flagging the unconstitutionality of these bills. You know, we are having judges, you know, agree with us. Uh, just today, I, today or yesterday, I believe there was a lawsuit that was filed by a parent because he didn't want to have the LGBTQ flag flown in his child's school. So I have friends of mine who are professors uh, at, uh, you know, higher, uh, higher education universities. So at UF or USF, and they're sending me their emails from their dean saying, I don't know what to teach. I've had, you know, teachers who are constituents of mine saying, listen, we were getting into a conversation about Emmett Till, and I was talking about what happened to Emmett Till, actual real history, and literally the teacher stopping in the middle of the conversation saying, you know what, let me not say too much. I don't know if I can say that. And the seventh grade child is saying, well, they don't want us to learn. So not only are we thinking about the legal, the legal functions of this legislation, but it's literally having immediate impact on how people move as teachers, how the, how parents decide where their children are going to go, um, the information that, you know, uh, people are receiving in school. So it is I think I, I would say by design, it, it, these are the intended consequences. Um, but, you know, I would I leave that up to to other people who are much more learned than I am. Yeah, there was a question and I know I said I was going to do them at the end, but it's kind of relevant uh, right away. But there was a question from the audience from uh, um, Olivia, who said, wait a minute minute we thought the so-called don't say gay was to prevent schools exposing any sexual materials to kids from preschool to third graders that is ages from two to eight years old what does that have to do anything to do with with anti-gay or anti-trans and uh you know i thought that was a pretty good uh question uh that uh you know wh whoever wants to jump in and answer that i'll take the first swing at that and say um it is the, I would say, sort of like misrepresentation behind what the bill sponsors pitched it as. And again, we know that it was not just about uh, making sure that there wasn't discussion on sexual activity or sexual materials, because amendments were introduced to make that expressly clear, and they were soundly rejected. Um, and those were amendments by actually both Democrats and Republicans that we're trying to bring more clarity to this. But when you talk about sexual orientation and gender identity, these are big terms and they're terms that are not defined in Florida statute. So it's unclear what they mean. And so that's why we have all these issues with the vagueness behind this law and you know, whether that means now a teacher is unable to acknowledge that there are parents uh, who may be same sex parents as a couple. Um, or you know, when you talk about family structures, what are you allowed to bring up as part of quote unquote classroom instruction? What even is classroom instruction? Is having a bulletin board that acknowledges, you know, June is LGBTQ Pride Month or October is LGBTQ History Month. Is that classroom instruction? Uh, there were so many opportunities to narrow this and make it specific to sexual materials or sexual conduct if that was really the goal, but it clearly wasn't. Anybody else before I move on? Okay. 
Uh, next question is for all speakers, and it is, what effect does this type of litigate legislation have on children, teachers, and the school system? And first off is just a personal anecdote. I started, as soon as this, this uh, legislation went into effect, I started getting a lot of calls from uh, high school teachers who and, and counselors who were, you know, I, I knew or was friends with or whatever with, who were having, uh, you know, their safe space signs taken down or were being told they can't discuss these things with children. And again, these are high school teachers and, and counselors, which is not what you would just generally think if you are not a lawyer and you look at the text of that law. So uh, again, what effect does this type of legislation have on children's teachers and school system? Anybody? Nobody wants to talk. Well, I kind of think I highlighted it, you know, with the last answer of, you know, just even the personal anecdotes of, you know, constituents who are teachers, who are parents. Um, and I think, um, you know, John Harris also touched on it as well. You know, there's a lot of confusion about what is classroom instruction, what is diversity training, how, you know, feeling uncomfortable is subjective, right? Like, uh, you know, what makes, what may make me feel uncomfortable may not make you feel uncomfortable. Um, you know, also I think about, you know, I, you know, I, and I see this in the chat, you know, when some, what happens when a middle school student wants to discuss their sexual identity with their school psychologist, right? Like, so, you know, even that was kind of, and initially there was going to be a, uh, an amendment, I know John, John Harris, I don't know if you remember it, it's going to be an amendment where it was going to force educators to out students to their parents. And all of us can agree here that, that, you know, there is extreme, problems with that, you know. Um, so I, I think that it's really putting us in a very, very um, just murky uh, waters, I think, socially, legally. And um, I, I, it, it is, I think, really affecting um, students and teachers and business owners much more than we actually think. What other states are enacting similar legislation because of Florida's legislation? Um, anybody? John Harris? Well, I'll jump in on other states, um, but really quickly, one other effect, I think Representative Rayner mentioned well, and Rook, you touched on as well, the fear that's being created by this legislation, by the uncertainty that's out there, um, and the really serious impact we're having on mental health for our minority students who see themselves being erased or getting this impression that talking about themselves, their experiences is somehow a bad thing or a negative thing. Um, and in addition to that, we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on teachers leaving the profession in Florida. We have a crisis for education in Florida. Not that we don't have enough teachers in the state, but we don't have enough people willing to teach because laws like this have made the environment so hostile. And in the case of both of these laws, we just saw new uh, rules around the standards of professional conduct for our teachers uh, that would essentially put their licensing in jeopardy for suspension or revocation if they're quote unquote violating these laws. And I think that's really interesting because in the case of Don't Say LGBTQ in particular, there was a lot of emphasis put on the fact that uh, this isn't about the teachers, the enforcement is actually against the school districts. So if a parent thinks that the law has been violated, they're suing the school district and taking it up with the school district, not an individual teacher. Well, now you do have the individual teachers being put on the hook. Um, and even in a recent motion to dismiss that came out of the Northern District around Don't Say LGBTQ, that I think we'll talk about that case a little bit later, you had the judge expressly saying, uh, noting that the fact the law is not enforced directly against plaintiffs, one of whom was a teacher, is irrelevant factor here for why they thought standing didn't exist. So again, we see the sort of pernicious impacts of these laws. They never sort of stay in the box of the black letter there. And there are these chilling effects or these, these tangential effects uh, that are so damaging. So it's a concern, obviously, for us being based in Florida that we have it here. There are, if you uh, look up the Movement Advancement Project, 
they actually identify five other states that already have similar laws to don't say LGBTQ on the books. Uh, those are Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. And that is touching on legislation that censures discussion of LGBTQ people and topics. Those actually predate this um, most recent push around don't say LGBTQ specifically, but we have seen sort of cookie cutter versions of that legislation introduced in numerous other states, Georgia, Texas, what have you, getting pretty close to passage in some of those places, talk about a national don't say LGBTQ law. So I think what happened and what passed in Florida is unfortunately just the beginning of a fight that we're gonna see a lot more nationally. Um, and I expect the same around Stop Woke, but I'll turn it over to others as well. Yeah, I just wanted to say a few things about the effects of Stop Woke. I think something else that's really important to keep in mind is that the bill is following educational institutions in Florida, both at the K through 12 level and particularly at the higher ed who in response to mass movements for racial justice actually took concrete steps to make their learning environments more inclusive, to have more classes, more discussions, more opportunities for students, faculty, and staff to talk about difficult topics, to talk about race, and to talk about gender, and to talk about inequality. And what the Stop Woke Act does is it prevents those schools from actually continuing to make their own institutions comfortable um, based on you know, their own assessment of student need and community need. So that is another really significant um, effect and consequence, I would say, is that schools are really grappling with what they should do and how they should respond and how they need to balance compliance with the law with a desire to make inclusive, affirming educational spaces. Um, for students. And then in terms of similar bills, a lot of the bills that have restricted, you know, the teaching of critical race theory and restricted discussion about different topics actually came before the Stop Woke Act, um, following the Trump executive order on race and gender stereotyping. More than two dozen states actually proposed and enacted laws that restricted teaching of those same or similar concepts in some way. What makes Florida very unique from pretty much all of the bills we've seen is the way that it also goes after higher education. Um, so I'm not sure if other states are gonna follow suit in that way. And yes, many folks on this call know Florida is doing a lot of things. To, or the state of Florida is doing a lot of things to really transform higher education, transform the relationship between the executive and you know, the independence and academic autonomy of institutions in Florida. Okay, well, our next question is, what litigation has been filed or will be filed in response to these? And one of the audience members also asked if we have we've seen coalitions consisting of folks opposing these anti-trans, anti-LGBT legislation and folks opposing the attacks on CRT as well. John Harris, you wanna start? Sure. Uh, in terms of litigation, we have seen a lot of challenges uh, to both pieces of legislation. In Florida, on the Stop Woke Act, you basically have uh, educational plaintiffs suing to push back and business plaintiffs suing to push back. In the Don't Say LGBTQ realm, there are two federal cases that have been filed. Um, Equality Florida has been a plaintiff to one of those, the one in the Northern District of Florida. Uh, there was another, and that case was brought by Kaplan Hecker Law Firm, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and attorney Elizabeth Schwartz. It was a group of plaintiffs, uh, families, whether those are uh, same-sex LGBTQ parents or parents of LGBTQ <laughs> youth, um, or youth who may be LGBTQ, uh, as well as teachers and organizational plaintiffs, again, like Equality Florida, Family Equality. In the middle district of Florida, you had, I would say, a similar lawsuit 
uh, that was brought by Lambda Legal, Southern Legal Council, and Southern Poverty Law Center um, with similar plaintiffs. Both of those have uh, just recently been dismissed for a lack of standing. Uh, that was pretty surprising to us, but uh, in the Northern District, that's going to be uh, re pled and I believe in the middle district as well. Uh, it was actually interesting in the middle district, it was dismissed sua sponte in response to the plaintiff's uh, motion for preliminary injunction. So um, I think tough roads ahead there, but a lot of confidence ultimately in the claims there. And I would expect long roads um, for that litigation uh, in both sort of areas. Also just worth noting, Again, as mentioned earlier, uh, we did recently see a parent using Don't Say LGBTQ uh, to sue a school district for putting up rainbow flags, claiming that a middle school teacher uh, was trying to change their child student's beliefs. Um, interestingly, the plaintiff there is a father who was reportedly suspended from practicing law for 15 months in New Zealand before he came to Florida. Um, and again, also interesting that in that motion to dismiss in the Northern District, uh, the case that Equality Florida was part of, the judge expressly stated that there was no vagueness issue um, specifically about the ability to have a rainbow flag in a classroom because that is not classroom instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity. So clearly we do in fact have a lot of uh, confusion about what constitutes discussion of sexual orientation or gender identity if you've got folks bringing these claims as they can under that law. So. Um, I'll turn it over to Isabella and others uh, for a little more on the litigation. Yeah, on the Stop Woke Act, I'll say, and uh, as Renika already uh, indicated, is Chief Judge Walker of the Northern District of Florida currently has, um, I'm at least familiar with four different cases challenging the Stop Woke Act. Um, and I'm whether there are more down the pike, I'm not sure, but uh, certainly the, the four staggered slightly, um, although they're likely to follow a similar track. Um, but the short answer to the question is, there has been plenty of litigation so far, and it's all come pretty quickly uh, on the heels of these laws going into effect. Um, and at least one so far has been successful in preliminarily enjoining part of the law. Um, and a few, two other cases have a preliminary injunction decision outstanding still. And so we'll see um, what comes of that. But um, in the Northern District of Florida, at least there are four cases pending, um, whether there are others pending elsewhere. Um, I'm not sure. And I think my co-counsel can answer that. There are also cases in Oklahoma and um, New Hampshire that are challenging laws that are quite similar to the Stop Woke Act. Again, um, those are primarily K through 12 challenges. The, the other thing I wanted to just go back to is just the larger coalition um, and the question about whether there are groups working across issue areas. So not just, you know, folks working on the uh, educational bills that focus on race and sex, and then other folks working on educational bills that are more about um, LGBTQ identity. And I know that a lot of the different national organizations that work on these issues do meet regularly to kind of talk through the best way for us to be supporting one another's work, even if we don't have capacity to file lawsuits in all of these places um, at the same time. Yeah, that's a really great point. And one other thing to highlight is just to the extent that we're seeing legislation that's painting with such a broad brush and really touching on so many different constitutional issues, you're going to see a bit of a uh, sometimes some, some strange coalitions, some surprising coalitions. And that's because it really does uh, it, it strikes people that if one group is in power right now, if that were to change and suddenly we've set bad precedent, right, then maybe their, whether their favored viewpoints 
uh, at this point could suddenly become the disfavored viewpoints at a later time. And once we've set these principles in law, it becomes a lot harder to correct that later on. And so uh, it does kind of create and, and bring together these broader coalitions on these points um, because there is some looking to the future and saying, okay, well, what if, what if things pivot and maybe things aren't in my favor anymore? And so to that end, um, it can it can be heartening sometimes to see when there, there can be coalitions that are built that we wouldn't otherwise see. Um, but that should also be a good indication that there we've kind of crossed a threshold here and it, and it's causing um, a lot of individuals concern. Yeah, and I'll just add, I think we're seeing some good coalition work in space on these sort of issues. In Florida, we really feel it. I mean, when you talk about things like Stop Woke and these book banning bills and curriculum bills, they are so connected. The, Books that they're targeting are those that have LGBTQ authors or authors of color, usually Black authors, um, or primarily narratives about LGBTQ or Black characters. Um, they're sort of coming from the same corners when we see these challenges. Again, whether they're more focused around race, whether they're focused on gender for sort of that particular round. Um, I wish we saw more of that coalition work. I think there are some natural interested uh, and impacted allies who should be showing up more, um, particularly when you talk about things like the Stop Woke Act that has so many implications for the business community. It's really a government overreach uh, that is so such an affront to business owners telling them about how they can conduct their business, how they can have these diversity, equity, inclusion trainings, what sort of atmosphere they're allowed to have in their workspaces. Um, it's an approach we really haven't seen typically in Florida. Um, and I think there are a lot more partners who could be at the table and should be at the table for these fights um, and recognize that they're not in silos. It's certainly not just, you know, an LGBTQ issue or a trans issue for a given bill or a race and color issue on a given bill. And we need to be, need to be showing up for each other a lot in these spaces. Uh, I also saw a question in the comments about uh, a drag queen video that's sort of not the fodder for these bills, um, but I think interesting in terms of the theme here. Again, the Don't Say Gay Bill, the Stop Woke Act, we really see that as part of this censorship and surveillance agenda that is coming down from the Florida governor's mansion, sort of who is allowed to speak, what you're allowed to say and think even in this supposedly free state of Florida where you're free to believe what the government tells you to believe. Um, and there's been an issue made about these drag performances that video mentioned. Um, but otherwise, they've really been focusing on this idea of parental rights. And the whole reason that they should be in regulating in this area is parents' rights, parents' authority, you know, what a parent gets to choose for their child to see. And two really important points there. One, when you have these really broad uh, curriculum policies, you're letting a small vocal minority of parents determine what every parents' kids have access to when they get into book banning, because that pulls the books, not just for their own kids, but for every kid in that school district. Um, and when you talk about something like a drag show, you know, that is a place where parents have chosen to take their kids. So that is, again, this issue of parental rights that for, if we're going to claim that, um, then now the government is also telling you as a parent where you are not allowed to bring your kid. So a lot of conflicting messaging here. Um, and I know Representative Rayner feels that lack of uh, intellectual honesty and consistency in the legislature. And it's a real challenge for us in Florida. No, it definitely is. And I would just wanna highlight, you know, when we're thinking about um, curriculum, when we're thinking about what children are taught, I, I, and I, I brought this up on the house floor, parents already have the right to say if they want their children to have sex education in Florida schools. Like that's a thing that's already in the statute. It's already part of DOE, um, you know, handbook. That's that's something that it's not, uh, that is not there. So literally everything that, you know, um, HB 1557 outlines when it comes to like to don't say gay or parental rights, um, that is something that, 
a parent can already do. But what we're seeing, I feel, is the weaponization of the law and the manipulation of the law in order to achieve a political ideal or a political, you know, uh, outcome. And that is what's scary about it, because we are now having to, you know, enter into these litigation battles of things that we've already thought were actually have been litigated, right? Actually had been, you know, dealt with. Um, and I also think when you're thinking about, you know, the stop book, when you're thinking about book banning and all of those things, it is also, I feel that would be a government overreach as well. And to John Harris's point, when we're talking about parents' rights, well, what, what parents' rights supersedes another parent, right? And so I think that, you know, it is, it is very, it's a lot of circular logic. It's very, um, uh, it's, in, it, to, to John Harris's point, it's not very intellectually honest when we are, you know, talking about, you know, these particular bills, but also understanding as we're looking towards next session, um, you know, that's going to start in a few months, that these bills are the foundation of some other terrible stuff that is going to come and that is going to be litigated um, as well. Here's a, a quick question from the audience. Um, what do you think are the potential implications of a similar bill is proposed at the federal level as some Republicans have signaled they will do if they reclaim the House? Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> I mean, if it's proposed at a federal level, I mean, it, 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 I mean, it's, it would be devastating, right? Um, I, I think that you would see um, a lot of, I mean, litigation would just be through the roof. Obviously, I think a lot of the, the, those cases would go to the Supreme Court. Um, con it's concerning about the makeup of the Supreme Court right now and what that will look like. Um, so I think that you would start to see the rolling back of a lot of um, protections for folks. Um, and once again, I, you know, we can argue, I, I obviously, I think that we all can agree and level said that, you know, none of us agree that, you know, you know, uh, these things are legal or these things are right, but also understanding that, you know, everyone's like the law is apolitical. It's not right. It, there is political implications in everything that we do. And so I think that we have to be really mindful that this, that this could happen, you know, um, and, uh, I will let uh, the litig the litigators, because uh, I am a retired litigator, so <laughs> let the litigators take over. Anybody else? Yeah, I would say that litigation is something that you can bet on if there were going to be a federal proposal that was enacted. And I think we would raise a lot of the same claims that we're raising in Florida and in other states as well about the bill um, discriminating based on particular viewpoints, about it being motivated by an impermissible discriminatory purpose, whether that's you know towards people of color, whether that's towards LGBTQ people, women, other you know disadvantaged groups. But I think that another consequence is just an incredible national chilling effect, um, even in states where. A, you know, a bill like don't say um, LGBTQ or Stop Woke Act would never see the light of day statewide. I think that that would mean all educators across the country would really have to think about what that means and how they should conform. I also think it depends on what type of legislation is proposed. So, for example, we saw with one of former President Trump's executive orders that he had very similar concepts and a similar challenge was brought to those that are currently pending in Florida and that was ruled unconstitutional and nationally enjoined, right? So to the extent that it follows that type of model, then I completely agree. I think we can see a lot of similar, uh, similar litigation that buys off on what's already been done here. Um, but there are alternatives and the ways that they could try to structure this, for example, be it through some sort of federal funding withholding <laughs> um, and trying to impose that through other um, kind of carrot and stick means. 
And so in that way, I think that the litigation might also have to adapt um, to be structured differently and raise different challenges um, similar to, and I'm blinking on the name at this point, but it was uh, based on one of the ACA challenges, et cetera. And, and so, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's just it's just gonna depend on, on what that looks like. Um, I agree that there will be a lot of litigation. They won't, and and um, it'll happen really quickly. There is a blueprint already that folks can be buying off of to be able to bring challenges. Um, but also, if they're savvy, they'll try to make some end run around uh, these these types of litigation so that they aren't meeting those same. Um, injunctions that we've been seeing already. What can we as a what can we do as a legal community to help on these kind of issues? Okay, I'm happy to join in um, and to jump in here. I'm actually going to step back from kind of the legal community portion of it, but just say as a community member and and getting back to my roots at the ACLU with community organizing, I think the most important thing that people can be doing is going out and voting and showing up at local meetings, being vocal about the negative impact of these laws, both on themselves, their neighbors, etc. cetera, um, organizing, showing up at marches. Um, one thing that we just would talk about so much at the ACLU of Minnesota is that litigation is always reactive. <laughs> Even when we're talking about some sort of preemptive challenge. The law hasn't gone into effect yet. You can't you can't actually bring that litigation until there's a law that's been drafted and it's going to go into effect. And so it's always reactive. It's just one tool that we can use, but we have all these other options and that are far more proactive than litigation. It is always better to be able to avoid this type of litigation from ever being uh being proposed. And, and so I would say to the extent that you can take the time and go out and engage with community and be vocal and uh, to be able to vote, <laughs> please do so because we need that. I would also say, and plus one to everything Isabella just said, plus one, um, I too was an organizer way back in the day, so 100% agree with everything. But I would just say, even if you want to use your legal skills, but you're not a litigator, you're not a civil rights attorney, but you're really good at research, right? So maybe, you know, call like Equality Florida or call your local ACLU and say, hey, listen, like, what are y'all doing? Do you mind if I research this? Do you mind if I do this? What if you're a really, you know, a really good writer? Hey, let me write a memo. Let me write, you know, I can help, you know, work on, you know, a motion. So, I mean, so you don't necessarily have to uh, you be like going into the courtroom and arguing these cases, but if there's a niche that you're good at, ask if that you can use that niche and give give you of your time to that give up your time to organizations that are maybe doing the actual heavy lifting of the litigation um because i can 100% tell you they will welcome that they will welcome that help how are we seeing these types of legislations being extended I would say in Florida, what we've really seen a lot of over the summer and the fall is where this legislation is shifting into the administrative realm. And it's been sort of this top down push into the state agencies where the state agencies are really being weaponized against Floridians. So I mentioned the State Board of Education doing its rulemaking uh, in a way that really is now putting the original Don't Say LGBTQ Law and Stop Woke Act into these standards of professional conduct. We've also seen a lot of attacks on um, access to healthcare for the Florida's transgender community. Uh, it's coming about in our state Medicaid agency, the Department of Health, the Board of Medicine, the Board of Osteopathy. Um, it's really this scary proliferation uh, throughout the agencies. Uh, so again, not just moving beyond the states where it's enacted to sort of provide a template for others, 
but also finding its way into new um, sort of organs of government, I would say. I guess the last question I really have, and I'm going to bug everybody about it, is what gives you hope? Uh, so how about we haven't heard from Moronika in a little bit. How about you start? Sure, I would say a few things give me hope. I think first, you know, no matter how terrible the piece of legislation is, there are still so many members of the public and so many community members who take time out of their day, take time off of work and school to actually go and testify and be heard and to let it be known that there are people on the other side. And as you know, Rep Brainer said earlier, that record is so important, not only for litigation, but just as like a, a public living document that people don't agree with the things that their legislature is doing. So I think that certainly gives me hope. I think people who are willing to serve in plaintiffs, not just in our case, but in any, I mean, they are taking such an incredible risk and in telling their story publicly and putting themselves out there and opening themselves up to, you know, scrutiny and backlash and being you know, talked about by, you know, media and doxing and so, so, so much. And they're doing it in service of other, so many other people who can't. And so I just feel that that is one of the most admirable things that you can do um, to fight on behalf of the civil rights of others. Wants to go next. I'm happy to jump in. Uh, I feel like I can get pretty depressing talking about some of these issues. So I like this question um, and it's a good note, I think, to end on. I'd say one of the things that gives me a lot of hope um, that we saw in Florida was our young folks. Um, I hope that they come out to vote as well, but we certainly saw them pour out of their schools this summer with walkouts and not even combined just to Florida, um, but thousands of students who showed up at the Capitol or walked out of their schools to protest things like don't say LGBTQ because they know they're the most directly impacted by this legislation. And it was really impactful. And I know we talked about that on staff, you know, what it would have meant for us um, when we were, you know, younger queer folks in school to see so many of our uh, colleagues and our peers step out like that. Um, because these weren't, clearly were not just the LGBTQ kids. It was, huge swaths of the student body. So that was really powerful. Um, and another thing, I'll actually pull an example that uh, Equality Florida's Executive Director Nadine Smith likes to point to, and it's what she calls the Barbara Streisand effect, um, not just because it's the gayest example, but um, it is this idea, you may have seen, you know, Google took this, undertook this project to map the whole uh, California coast with aerial mapping. And that included uh, Barbara Streisand's property. And she took issue with it. And you know, before the lawsuit, I don't know, there were probably 18 people who had ever seen these images. But she filed a lawsuit, she made an issue of it, and then there were something like 12 million views. And I think that's really the moment that we're having around particularly transgender issues in Florida at the moment. There are so many of these attacks far exceeding just what we've talked about on the webinar today that ultimately I know we'll win, but we're going through this really difficult process of having to do the storytelling that all of these attacks um, are leading to. So, you know, when we look at things like the marriage equality fight, I think we lost something like 38 times in a row, but after each one of those, we could see the difference in the polling. We could see that when we started telling love stories about same-sex couples, hearts and minds were shifting. So it's a really painful process to get there, but the legislature is shining a spotlight on a community that's been really misunderstood um, intentionally or unintentionally for a long time. And so I do have hope and faith that eventually, you know, we'll come out on the other side of it. So that's one of the things that gives me hope. Representative Reiner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you go ahead. Um, so a couple of things give me hope. One, um, 
having seeing lawyers like John Harris, Monica, and Isabella, that like gives me hope. Um, I and I don't say that just because y'all are on here, but y'all are fighting these fights in the courtroom. You are, you know speaking for so many people in ways that I think are incredible. And um, so that gives me hope that like lets me know, okay, like, you know, we can do this. Um, I think that um, also knowing that there are more people that are on our side that than those who are not. And to John Harris's point of you know, while it is very <laughs> tough and depressing, and sometimes you're just like, what are we doing? Like, what are we doing here? Knowing that, you know, when we, when we think about justice, when we think about, you know, the, 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 the arc of justice, you know, um, the, it, the moral arc of the universe always bends towards justice, right? And so understanding, you know, yeah, it's a long road. Yeah, it's, it's hard, but, also knowing that we will get to the point where everyone in our collective community, collective nation are, has the same access to the things that need, they need to live equitable lives and can just literally be um, who they are and be um, just loved as in their, in their humanness. And so that's what gives me hope. I know that sounds like a little Pollyanna, but I have to believe that in order to kind of stay in this work. Um, and, uh, and that's what I do. So, so for, to the lawyers that are on here that are doing the work, I, you are heroes to me. So thank you, um, for, um, the work that you do. So I will be very brief. Um, what gives me the most hope is my son. Um, I have to hope that, I'm contributing to a world in which he's going to grow up and have it better than I did. And so uh, if I didn't believe that I couldn't have kids, uh, it would be too depressing. And so for that, I am hope I'm ever hopeful um, for him and for, as John Harris said, for all the young people out there, because I think that, um, yeah, th they are hopefully uh, going to be coming into a world that's much better than, than what we're seeing today. All righty. Well, I guess we're a little bit over time, but uh, any closing thoughts before we uh, say goodbye to everybody? Thank you for having this. I think it's super important for lawyers to to really kind of see the impact in a real way, right? Like, I mean, we can talk about it, but actually like really having these conversations of, the impact not only on our work as attorneys, but also just how we live our lives and how we move. And so I just appreciate um, the ABA y'all um, for doing this. Yes, and I'd like to thank all of our, uh, in addition to our sponsors, the uh, you know panelists here, uh, you know, for taking time out of their days to come talk to everybody. Um, but I guess uh, really that's it. Um, Thank you all. Thanks, folks. Thanks. Thanks.